This is the Cameron Journal Podcast. It's a place where we talk about important things. It's a place where we bring a little slice of the news to you. And it's a place where we do important things, have important conversations. It's also things that I like to talk about. My name is Cameron Cowan, and this is the Cameron Journal Podcast. apologize for <clears throat> ending the stream and having to restart. I had some technical issues on this side um, to do with internet bandwidth. Um, I don't have great internet here. I've never had great internet here. And for the longest time, it didn't matter because I didn't do video and didn't do streaming. Now that I do video and streaming, my lackluster connectivity is beginning to show. So I'm going to start over with what I was talking about before um, so that um, at least the recording will be complete because um, the I had a complete technical failure. The first 15 minutes was completely lost. So, <clears throat> um, so I want to kind of go back to the beginning and say um, I... Uh, I, it has been a slow news week, um, and, uh, the, right now the big discourse has to do with the Barbie movie and Oppenheimer, or the Barbenheimer phenomena, and I am patiently waiting for both of those movies to come on to streaming, because as much as I would like to go to the movie theater and watch them back to back and just have the whole kind of mind-blowing experience, um, I have neither the time nor the inclination to go sit in a movie theater right now. So I'm going to wait for them to come out on streaming and then they will be showing at Cameron's Home Cinema's one screen. So, um, so that, but I do have a couple news stories about the discourse about the Barbenheimer phenomena. Um, otherwise it has been a little bit of a slow a slow news week. Um, not a ton of stuff has happened, although the big story that I had already read, and we're gonna go again, um, is the January 6th investigation in, into Donald Trump. Um, last week he was uh, sent a target letter, um, which means he'll be facing possible indictment for his, his leading and participation in the January 6th insurrection. It says here that former President Donald J. Trump has been informed that he could soon face federal indictment for his efforts to hold on to power after his 2020 election loss, potentially adding to the remarkable array of criminal charges and other legal troubles facing him even as he campaigns to return to the White House. Mr. Trump was informed by his lawyers on Sunday that he had received a so-called target letter from Jack Smith, the special counsel, investigating his attempts to reverse his defeat at the polls. Mr. Trump and other people familiar with the matter said on Tuesday, prosecutors are used target letters to tell potential defendants that investigators have evidence tying them to crimes and that they could be subject to indictment. Deranged Jack Smith sent Mr. Trump a letter on Sunday night informing him that he was a, quote, target of the January 6th grand jury, unquote, investigation, Mr. Trump said in a post on a social media platform. Such a letter almost always means arrest and indictment, wrote Mr. Trump, whose campaign is rooted in accusations of political persecution and a promise to purge the Justice Department and Federal Bureau of Investigation of personnel he sees as hostile to him and his agenda. Mr. Smith's spokesman had no comment. An indictment of Mr. Trump would be the second brought by Mr. Smith, who is also prosecuting the former president for risking national security secrets by taking classified documents from the White House and obstructing the government's efforts to reclaim the material. Mr. Trump is also under indictment in Manhattan on charges related to hush money payments to a porn star before the 2016 election, and he faces the likelihood of charges from the district attorney in Fulton County, Georgia, who's been conducting a wide-ranging inquiry into Mr. Trump's attempts to reverse his 2020 election loss in that state. The target letter cited three statutes that could be applied in a persecution 
played in the prosecution of Mr. Trump and Mr. Smith's team. A person briefed on the matter said they include a potential charge of conspiracy to defraud the United States and a broad charge related to a violation of rights. Whether Mr. Smith and his prosecutors will choose to charge Mr. Trump on any or all of those statutes remained unclear, but they appear to have assembled evidence about an array of tactics that Mr. Trump and his allies used to stave off the def his election defeat. <clears throat> and it goes into some other people and who... Uh, and what he is up to and him wanting to clean out the FBI and the Justice Department and all the machinations they went through, including the fake electors, um, trying to convince Mike Pence to stop it in uh, the joint Congress to just certify the election and uh, and also to uh, try to rig the vote in, in Georgia. So, um, and obviously we all know ultimately this led to January 6th, the day they were certifying the vote of people going to Washington for a march and it turning into a complete disaster, um, wherein we almost lost democracy. Um, so that is, um, that was kind of the big news story last week. I, before I had technical issues, I was remarking on the fact that as difficult um, as this all is for the country. And as much as I think it is very important, I can't help but be reminded of Adolf Hitler and the Beer Hall Putsch in Munich in uh, 1925. Um, now, the difference being that Hitler hadn't yet to gain any political power in Germany, um, and Mr. Trump has already had and lost political power. Um, but when it, as people have pointed out, a failed coup is merely a dress rehearsal for the real thing. And I wonder what the political downstream effects of this prosecution and um and and this will be in terms of what will people do what will he do and if you know he gets power again um what will happen as he attempts to uh clean out the government of all the people he does not deem worthy and so I think it's um, it's something to think about. Um, it's something to struggle with. And I, it's something that I think we have to keep a very close eye on. And I think really the only way to prevent Mr. Trump from completely wresting pow the power of government away from us all is to make sure he never gets anywhere near the levers of power ever again. Simple as. Um, but that may not be what's in the cards, considering right now he's the front runner for the Republican nomination. So, um, yeah. I'm not going to mention this um, because uh, I kind of talked about it in my original monologue that was lost, but you also might have heard that uh, Elon Musk is planning on changing <clears throat> Twitter's name and brand from Twitter to X, just X, um, and they've already been making that move by projecting the big X logo outside their headquarters and different Twitter staff have been changing um, their own profile pictures to that as well in support of the new move. Um, I don't know how you're going to change the language of tweets to like zeets or, you know, anything like that. Um, but uh, yeah, Elon just kind of jumped that on everybody over the weekend. And I know that he's trying to create an everything app like WeChat. I get that. But um, I, uh, I seriously wonder um, why he is destroying every bit of brand value that Twitter ever, ever had. Now, I read one theory today that said, well... Elon saw that, you know, leftists and other people were gathering politically on Twitter and were having an impact and they wanted to kill that. And I, I get that, but I think people also forget Twitter's power, it was never in the size of its user base. Twitter is a middling social platform. However, and this is very important, Twitter's power is that it is the home for politicians, it's the home for celebrities, it's the home for newsmakers news readers it is you know kind of there's a lot of very important heavy hitters on twitter and that's where the impact comes from that allows twitter to punch way above its weight because of who's on it not necessarily the amount of people that are on it instagram and facebook way more popular but twitter has a lot of important people 
And I think Elon doesn't understand that. He's thinking of it like, oh, I'm going to go up against Facebook. That's not what Twitter does well. What Twitter does well is being a town square and a place of public opinion, but it also is really a place for um, a, a wide variety of people from a wide variety of classes to all interact together as a whole. And I think he doesn't understand that that's the only reason Twitter ever punched above its weight. If Twitter had never gotten a lot of celebrities and, and important people on there, we wouldn't know what, we would have forgotten about Twitter. It would have withered on the vine, like what they did to vine. <laughs> it would have gone away by now. Its enduring quality is the, u not the user base in numbers, but the user base in terms of popularity and impact, you know. Um, this is a site that, you know, Barack Obama was the first president to tweet and uh, the White House to this day uses Twitter as a primary marketing tool. That can't be said of any other platform. You know, it does not have the same impact. But I do, I do think there is something to the fact, much like what Peter Thiel did to Gawker, um, these billionaires and all this type of thing, when they see people that oppose them and their views and their values, and all this type of thing, organizing in a location, the best and fastest way to reduce the impact of that effort is to um, buy it and kill it. And I think, at least for what we knew Twitter as, it's being killed. I don't think it's going to go away, but I think what we've known Twitter for and how it has functioned in our society is definitely going to go away in favor of a sort of neutered, middling social media platform. And uh, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, and I say that as someone who has been on Twitter since the beginning, I got my Twitter account in 2000. Eight, didn't start seriously using the platform till 2014 on a personal level, probably. Um, and uh, it, it's, it will be a sad day to watch Twitter fall down to the middling social platform. It, it really is. So uh, let's move on to another story. Um, this is kind of a side note. Um, there was an opinion today... Um, from Tammy Duckworth and Mark Ke Kelly. Mark Kelly is obviously a senator from Arizona, um, and Miss Duckworth is a senator from Illinois, and they uh, did this opinion piece on what is needed in Ukraine. And they say here that at the outset of the war, Russia had one of the largest militaries in the world, and it was widely assumed Russia would march through Ukraine and take Kiev in a matter of weeks, if not days. That didn't happen. The limitations of Russian military hardware, training, and discipline became evident quickly, as well as the strength of Ukrainian resolve. Still, from the earliest days of the conflict, we both saw that military aid from the United States would be critical for Ukraine to win this war. For the past 17 months, we have advised the Biden administration, urging it to continually assess and reassess the shifting realities on the front line so to understand what Ukraine needs and then deliver it quickly. We must remain committed to keeping Ukraine supplied with the missiles, artillery shells, and other munitions that at this stage in the conflict can be the difference between the commanders being able to approve an attack or not. And we have to do that while analyzing where new capabilities like modern fighter jets can give Ukraine the edge. War is dynamic. It requires us to look around the next corner. We heard from President Zelensky and met with other Ukrainian officials, and it was clear to us that Ukraine needs not just guns and ammunition, but also other, newer capabilities that can decisively alter the direction of the fast-evolving conflict. In the early weeks of the war, Javelin and Stinger missiles were needed to blunt the advantage of Russian armored vehicles and aircraft, then long-range mobile artillery to hit Russian positions. After that, high-mobility artillery rocket systems to strike strategic targets farther behind Russian lines than, and then main battle tanks to break them. Not every weapon system can come off a warehouse shelf and be quickly put to use in the battlefield. That is certainly the case with the F-16. We have both flown in combat. It took hundreds of flight hours to learn to fly the aircraft and more to master the range of different missions we'd be asked to carry out, whether that was dropping bombs on a target or conducting combat search and rescue. That's why we encouraged the Pentagon in March to analyze what it would take to train Ukrainian pilots and maintainers on modern F-16 fighter jets to replace their aging fighters such... <clears throat> as MiG-29s and understand their specific uses in the context of the war. Last week, the United States reiterated its commitment to supporting its allies to train Ukrainian pilots to fly the American-made F-16, a great step forward in strengthening Ukraine's capabilities in the long term. 
And then it goes into the big thing that also happened last week was uh, the cluster munitions situation. And it, and it, it says here, the cluster weapons that Mr. Zelensky has requested are effective against spread out targets like groups of dug-in infantry, artillery batteries, and vehicle convoys. Those weapons will help Ukraine to carry out a successful counteroffensive and help ensure that its military has sufficient munitions to defend itself. Failing to do so, after all, is what would pose the gravest risk to people who call Ukraine home. The Ukrainians are now several weeks into their counter-offensive, hoping that with the correct tactics, determination, and Western hardware, they can retake their country. Vladimir Putin is conscripting his citizens, seemingly banking on the belief that he can outlast the West and conquer Ukraine, and then move on to his next, next objective. It is vital that he fail. A world with Ukraine victory is a safer one. It is a world in which we can further strengthen the NATO alliance and establish a bulwark against tyrants like Mr. Putin. The two of us know what it means to sacrifice for our country, but even we have never experienced what it is to fight on your own soil, with your own families and neighborhoods in harm's way, to defend the ability of your children and their children to inherit a free homeland. Now, as much as ever, we must remain steadfast in our belief that the Ukrainian people and un are undeterred in our work to give them the support that they need. I thought it was interesting um, for this to come out at this juncture, given what's happening with... Uh, you know, the you have 16s and the cluster munitions and all this type of thing. Um, obviously, you know, these both being Democrats, this was probably coordinated with the White House to help, you know, bolster the policy and all this type of thing. Um, there's When it comes to the cluster munitions, because they cause such damage, the Ukrainians have agreed to document where they use them to clean them up afterwards. The Russian ones oftentimes dud and don't work, and that will be something the Ukrainians are cleaning up for decades, probably. Um, and, uh, it is, it is a, it is an interesting, m much like Lend-Lease leading up to World War II, um, the cost and scope of this war keeps getting more and keeps expanding, and we, I think we all know and accept this is a proxy war of the West against Russia and the Ukraines are doing the dying, but I think this whole situation is kind of getting out of of control. Um, and while I appreciate the support from Senators Duckworth and Kelly, this war in Ukraine needs to end sooner rather than later. Um, and as I've always said about the war in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine continues at the pleasure of Washington and Berlin. Um, the European Union and the U.S. could end this war tomorrow if they so chose. They just don't choose to. So moving on to another kind of ancillary story, um, <laughs> this interesting, a, a large new study um, released on Monday shows that it has not been, uh, says here in the Times, Lisa Monday shows us not been because uh, children have a new, a more impressive grade or average to Carter classes. Um, children at going to elite colleges at Ivy League schools, one in six students has parents in the top 1%. In fact, the study shows that you have a 2.2 times likelier admission if your parents are wealthy than all other student types um, when adjusted for test scores. So um, that is... Uh, <laughs> um, it pays to be rich. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, the study was done by Opportunity Insights, a group of economists based at Harvard who study inequality and quantifies for the first time the extent to which being very rich is its own qualification in selective college admissions. Now, the only, and I'm not going to get into the rest of this because it's not important, but this comes after the Supreme Court decision that we talked about a couple weeks ago where they ended affirmative action. Wesleyan College announced they were ending legacy admissions. And so now there's kind of this question of, well, who gets into what college? Who is chosen and selected and why? And so this study is prescient because it shows if you really want to get into an Ivy League school, simply be rich. Meritocracy doesn't matter. Just be very wealthy and you're home free. So, um, that has, uh, that has, you know, I think an important in terms of creating the meritocracy that we like to talk about in this country. I think it is very important to be mindful of that and to have, um, 
to have a conversation about how we genuinely create merit meritocracy that isn't uh, based entirely on one's economic background. And that's not an easy thing to do. It, it is not. Um, speaking of education, we have another story from the Times. Um, Arizona has a new experiment in school choice. Um, it says here that um, uh, that Arizona will allow parents to choose a private school and be able to take their dollars with them. Um, in a plan approved, says here in the Times, in a plan approved by the Republican-controlled legislature last year, Arizona became the first state to make every student, even those from wealthy families, eligible for a school voucher, on average worth about $7,200 per student annually. The state deposits the money into an education savings account for parents, which can be used to pay for private school or homeschooling. If the student was enrolled in public school, the money follows the student. If the student was being privately educated, the voucher is a new cost to the state. The program has been highly contentious and hugely popular. Since launching last September, it has grown from about 12,000 students to more than 59,000, outpacing projections. State education officials estimate enrollment could grow to 100,000 by next summer. Fueled by the pandemic and an ascendance parents' rights movement, other Republican states are moving in a similar direction. Arkansas, Florida, Iowa, and Utah approved universal programs this year, and Indiana and Ohio expanded existing programs to nearly all students. For decades, vouchers were limited to certain students, low-income children, students with disabilities, children zoned in low-performing schools. Major expansion efforts have op were often blocked, including by Arizona voters in 2018. Now, advocates are finding new success with an encompassing message, parent choice for all. Every family, they say, should be able to choose a school that is right for them, and every child should have access to high-quality education. Nobody can do a better job of choosing what's best for the child than the parents, Mr. Horn said in an interview at the Department of Education, where Empower Parent signs punctuate the hallways. Um, it is a difficult thing, and it says here, vouchers come with a little accountability. Well, of course. Um, unlike public schools, including charters, private schools, and homeschool parents, are generally not required to administer state tests or report student outcomes. And herein lies the problem. <laughs> um, we already have in this country, because of how we fund education, and it is primarily through local control, we already have 50 different ways of educating children in this country. Every state does it a little bit differently. And I was reading on Twitter this morning, someone was kind of like, well, you know, yeah, there should be regional variants in how kids are educated so that people who live in certain parts of the country shouldn't have to have their children, you know, indoctrinated or forced to learn something. Um, and I, I think the opposite is true. What this country needs are national education standards. You know why we lag behind the rest of the developed world? Because we have 50 different ways of educating kids. And anybody who's been in the charter school space for any length of time knows charter schools have a bad habit of closing, failing, not making it, parents are left out in the cold. Um, I am a child of homeschooling. I'm not a fan for a wide variety of reasons. Um... I know other people who were homeschooled, not a fan of the homeschooling thing. It's easy for kids to end up sad, lonely, isolated, never really working on stuff, end up serving as childcare for younger siblings or parents, especially if they're poorer. Um, there's a lot of disparate outcomes that can happen. That's the advantage of public schooling. By having all the kids in a building at one place, they're at least going to learn something. If kids are being abused, it's school is where that sort of thing is going to come out. If kids are having other health and socioeconomic issues, the school is going to be able to provide resources for that, in not all cases, but many cases. And so when you just kind of say, okay, parents, here's a savings account with money, go have fun, um, it's basically the state giving up on making sure that all kids in that state are actually getting some type of education. Rather than making public schools better, this system is going to end public education as we've known it in this country. Which means there's a whole lot of kids, especially from poorer backgrounds, that may never get a chance to be... I'm talking they're not going to know how to read and write. Now, not that we don't produce kids who can't read and write in this country from the public school system. We do. But that number is going to increase. So, write it down. Mark it down here. This sort of system is going to adversely affect America's children from an education perspective.
just end up. And a lot of parents, and the article goes on to talk about how wealthy parents benefit because they basically get to offload part of their education cost onto the state. But, uh, you know, regardless of who is, you know, an outsized benefit, who has a less benefit, whatever have you, the reality is it is going to increase inequality within education because the kids that went to the crappy public school before are now going to end up at a, ch at a crappy charter school or a crappy Christian school or get crappily homeschooled. And the, re the end result of that is going to be that those kids are going to go from the frying pan into the fryer. And that is depressing in so many ways. So moving right along, though. Um, we're going to talk about the, uh, the other big thing that has happened, the Jason Aldean situation. So, in case you haven't heard, Jason Aldean put out a new song called Try That in a Small Town. And it says here, um, in May, the country star Jason Aldean released a single, Try That in a Small Town, with lyrics that paint contemporary urban life as a hellscape of crime and anarchy. Quote, sucker punch somebody on a sidewalk, carjack an old lady at a red light. You think you're tough, Aldean sings, we'll try that in a small town. Initially, the track got relatively little notice, landing at number 35 on Billboard's Hot Country Songs track. That changed last week after the song's music video became a culture war battlefield, with some accusing Al Dean, one of the country's biggest hit makers for nearly two decades, of employing racist dog whistle tactics and the singer defending himself as the latest victim of an out-of-control cancel culture. The controversy led to a rush on Al Dean's song, with both streams and downloads exploding over the course of the last week. Try That in a Small Town makes its debut as number two on the Hot 100, Al Dean's best showing ever on Billboard's all-genre pop chart, beating current hits by Olivia Rodrigo and Morgan Wallen. Al Dean was surpassed this week only by Jungkook of the South Korean supergroup BTS, whose debut solo single, Seven, opens at number one. The video for Try That, released on July 14th, opens with Al Dean performing before a stately building draped with an American flag. The structure was quickly identified as the Maury County Courthouse in Columbia, Tennessee, where a 1927 young black man named Henry Choat was lynched in a vigilante mob after being accused, falsely historians believe, of raping a white girl. The video features one montage after another of violent street protests, robberies, and people antagonizing police officers in riot gear. Those scenes are juxtaposed with images of American flags being hoisted, children playing what appears to be a television news segment about farmers helping out a neighbor. And then it goes on to the whole discourse about how it is all, um, how it's all gone on and, and what people have been talking about <clears throat> with it. And I will, I will say kind of only this, um, and that is that, uh, to a certain demographic who lives in smaller cities or smaller towns, I know this because a lot of them are in my family, um, they look at the images promoted on Fox News of the way big cities are, and that's what they perceive. Um, and I say that as someone who lives in downtown Seattle, in a not great part of town, my car has been broken into twice just this year. Um, I don't park downtown anymore. Um, I actually put my car in storage. Um, and, um, and I, uh, it's, uh, it's easy to accuse big cities of being awful, but I also have to say, I also live here. I go around here. I do stuff here. I've never been sucker punched. I've never been carjacked. Um, most of the violence is against property, which is still bad, but most of the violence is against property. It's not against, um, uh, it's not against people, usually. Um, and there is a halting effort to make that happen. But unfortunately, the dialogue right now around all of this has very little to do with the reality on the ground. People talk about, oh, San Francisco is so awful. It's actually not that bad. Oh, how, you know, I had a family member ask me, I don't understand how you live up there. And my mom was like, well, yeah, if I didn't know you and didn't know what life was really like and all this type of thing, I would think it was that bad too. And that's because, and especially if you look at right-wing media, and I subscribe to a bunch of newsletters and a bunch of news sites, that's what they promote. It's like, oh, this crime is up. This horrible thing happened to this person. This is the dialogue. And so when a song comes out expressing the popular myth, 
about what it's like to live in cities and how dangerous they are and the virtues of the small town people and, you know, and, you know, and the Volk and all this sort of thing, it's going to end up being popular because people want to reinforce their own biases against this stuff. And they want to reinforce the idea that they are the real, true, patriotic Americans and that anybody who doesn't live in a small town operating a small business or working a job or whatever have you simply isn't a real American and isn't a real patriot. And it does end up being racist because then the outgrowth of that, and you see this in the online dialogue, and I, I started to catalog this and save some of the memes and all this type of thing, um, is that people say, oh, well, you know, oh, there was crime. Well, what color was the person? The implication being that if crime is happening, that it must be a black person who's done it. And so this, the act, the song isn't racist on its face, but what it does do is it promotes a racist narrative that isn't helpful. <laughs> End of. That it's just not helpful. So that is, um, that's, that's the problem with, with that song. Obviously, he can sing and do whatever he wants. I'm not saying he should be canceled. I'm not saying the song should be taken off or anything like that. I don't think Mr. Aldean's probably really actually a racist, but he definitely is expressing a popular opinion that if you don't live in a small town dominated by white people, then you just aren't living. And that if anybody tries to come into their town and do these terrible things that degrade their quality of life, well, then they're gonna get you and just kill you. Um, that's probably not a message that we want out in general society. As a rule, regardless of the color of your skin or where you come from, we shouldn't be promoting violence as such. Now, speaking of promoting violence as such, um, I found this story in The Intercept, um, and it says, it, this has to do with COVID-19. It says here, key scientist in COVID origin controversy misled Congress on status of $8.9 million NIH grant. Uh, it says here, key researchers who testified before the House subcommittee investigating the origin of COVID nineteen of the COVID nineteen virus last week misled Congress about the nature of a multi million dollar grant that was pending. At the time, they joined a critical conference with doctors Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci in February of twenty twenty, according to the National Institutes of Health documents. The debate over the origin of the novel coronavirus has also evolved into a meta debate over how the narrative supporting a natural emergence was initially crafted in the winter and spring of twenty twenty. That inquiry focuses on a group of scientists who spoke confidentially with Collins and Fauci, then the heads of the NIH and its sub-agency of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, respectively, in February, and quickly began writing a paper that would set the tone for public understanding of the virus's origin for a year or more. On the call, the scientists suggested that they leaned towards a lab escape as the most likely scenario, but they made a U-turn later that day when they began drafting it. The paper eventually ran in Nature Medicine under the headline, The Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2. Fauci and Collins were kept in the loop on the preparation of the paper, and Fauci highlighted it to the public in order to dismiss the notion of a lab escape. House Republicans convened a hearing last week on the conference call and resulting paper, and one of the major sources of contention was the extent to which Fauci and Collins held financial sway over the scientists, who also had a grant application pending before the NIH. Democrats repeatedly characterized the argument in terms of a bribe being paid in exchange for a paper that exonerated a lab in Wuhan, China, that the NIH had been funding to do the kind of risky research that could spark a pandemic. Rather than a bribe, though, the question is one of leverage. <clears throat> Christian Anderson of Scripps Research, who testified at the hearing along with Bob Gary of Tulane University, preempted the charge in his opening statement, telling the committee he had no live fundraising requests before Fauci's agency at the time of the call. There is no connection between the grant and the conclusions we reached about the origins of the pandemic. We applied for this grant in June of 2019. It was scored and reviewed by independent experts in June in November of 2019. Anderson testified. Based on the actual timeline of this grant, it is not possible that the merit-based federal grant awarding process was influenced by a call in February of 2020. Democrats, including Michigan Rep. Debbie Dingell, defended the integrity of the scientists. Under her questioning, Anderson reiterated that the grant application could have possibly influenced his willingness to publicly entertain the chance that risky research at the Wuhan lab may have led to the pandemic. If the grant were scored and reviewed as part of the NIH's transparent merit-based process in November 2019, is there any way that the awarding of the grant could have been used as a bribe during the February 1st, 2020 conference call Dingle asked? Excluding the possibility that someone is a time traveler, no, that is just not possible given the timeline Anderson insisted. Gary added, I agree. 
both knew that was false. Uh, newly uncovered messages indicate that Anderson was keenly aware that that perception of him among gain-of-function research advocates, such as Fauci, hinged on how he responded to the question of COVID's origin. Anderson and Gary did not respond to requests for comments. And it goes on to get into the messages and the grant and all this type of thing, and we needn't talk about all that. But the reason I wanted to bring it up is because for the longest time, um, it was generally accepted that, uh, you know, that they did come from a natural source from a wet market in China. And then the lab leak hypothesis came out. In fact, Brett Weinstein and Heather Hine were at the forefront of that. That came out, and it kind of seemed like a crazy conspiracy theory. And then it became so true, it became a punchline of, like, yeah, we all know it came from a lab now. Like, that, it has now become part of the discourse about COVID, that it did indeed come from a lab, it really is indeed a thing, and that, um, and that happened, and was, and was legit. So the fact that we're still investigating this, and talking about this, and that there appears to be some, uh, division on the subject, I think is, is interesting, especially giving, given funding mechanisms, and, and all this, all this sort of thing. <clears throat> so, the last few articles I have, we're going to move quickly because of our technical issues. Um, I have two stories about the Barbenheimer situation. Um, one is the money. So, um, the uh, bumper box office broke the usual pattern for blockbuster opening weekends, with several films contributing to the big numbers. Um, so, Barbie and Oppenheimer together... Um, Dominate made $312 million, which together as much as Star Wars, The Force Awakens, Avengers Infinity War, and Avengers Endgame. Um, and, uh, and it, they say it shows that Hollywood is going to be bounced back from the pandemic. Um, and, uh, and I think it's also interesting, um, and they point this out here as well, that, um, this is the first time we've gotten major numbers from movies that aren't Marvel or comic book focused, which I think is good. Um, so, I mean, outside of Star, I mean, Star Wars, you get big numbers, Marvel, you get big numbers, but mm, these movies are neither of those things. And so hopefully it's a harbinger for the future, but we're also having an actors and writers strike right now. So who knows what's going to happen, um, in terms of development and all this type of thing. Um, but the last part of the story I want to talk about um, is another story from the New York Times, and it is entertaining because it involves our friend from Florida, Matt Gates. And it says here, last week, Representative Matt Gates and his wife, Ginger, arrived at a Washington reception for Barbie in matching pink, grinning in photos alongside the pink carpet, mingling among guests, sipping pink cocktails, admiring a life-size pink toy box. They left with political ammunition. Quote, the Barbie I grew up with was a representation of limitless possibilities, embracing diverse careers and feminine empowerment, unquote, Mrs. Gates wrote on Twitter. The 2023 Barbie movie unfortunately neglects to address any notion of faith or family and tries to normalize the idea that men and women can't collaborate positively. Yuck. When another account scolded Mr. Gates, the hard right and perpetually stunt-seeking Florida congressman, for attending the event at all, citing the casting of a trans actor as Dr. Barbie, Mr. Gates replied with a culture-warring double feature. If you let trans stop you from seeing Margot Robbie, he said, leaving the T off the first name of the film star, the terrorists win. The non-terroristic winners were many after the film's estimated $155 million debut. Miss Robbie and Greta Gerwig, the film's director, finding an eager audience for their pink-hued feminist opus. The Warner Brothers marketing team, whose ubiquitous campaigns plainly paid off, the film industry itself writing Barbie and Oppenheimer to its most culturally dominant weekend in years. But few outcomes were as nominally inexplicable and probably inevitable as the film's instant utility to political actors and opportunists of all kinds. For a modern take on what was a long, politically fraught emblem of toxic body image and reductive social norms, no choice was too small, no turn too ideologically affirming or apparently nefarious for a bipartisan coalition of commentators, and elected officials see value in its dissection. I have, like, pages and pages of notes, Ben Shapiro said, <clears throat> the popular conservative commentator, in a lengthy video review, which began with him setting a doll aflame and did not grow more charitable. He said his producers dragged him to the theater. I took a tequila shot every time Barbie said patriarchy. Only just woke up, wrote Elon Musk. 
Here are four ways Barbie embraces California values, the office of Gavin Newsom, the state's Democratic governor, wrote in a thread hailing Barbie as a champion of climate activism, hitting the roads in her electric vehicle, and of destigmatizing mental health care. If there was a time in the culture when a giant summer film event was something of an American unifier, a moment to share over-buttered popcorn th through big-budget shoot-em-ups and sagas of insatiable sharks, that time is not 2023. And as ever, the political class's performative investment in Barbie, the outage and the embrace can seem mostly like a winking bit. What to make of Governor Gretchen Whitmer, Democrat of Michigan, posing, posting a Barbie meant to resemble herself beside the Instagram cache and come on, Barbie, let's go govern? What does it mean exactly when Senator Raphael Warnock, Democrat of Georgia, says of himself, this Ken is pushing to end maternal mortality? Certainly Senator Ted Cruz, Republican of Texas, has some impractical... As as some in practice gravity in accusing Barbie of working to appease the Chinese. Some Republicans have fixated on a scene that features a crudely drawn map that supposedly depicts the so-called Nine Dash Line, which indicates Chinese ownership of ocean territory that is disputed under national law. Vietnam has banned showings of the movie in the country over the image. Obviously, the little girls that are going to see Barbie, none of them are going to have any idea what those dashes mean, Mr. Cruz told Fox News. This is really designed for the eyes of the Chinese censors, and they're trying to kiss up to the Chinese Communist Party because they want to make money selling the movie. And it goes on to other, other parts of the conservative movement, but I wanted to read this thread on Twitter from Richard Hanania. I don't, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's kind of long. But I, I've already read it, and so I'm going to um, I'm I'm going to uh, read the important part. It says here, in the final scene, Barbie goes Pinocchio-like into the real world. There's suspense as she arrives in an office, and the audience wonders what's the first thing she decided to do after becoming a real woman. I'm here to see my gynecologist. The movie started with genital jokes, and that's how it ended. This is a perfect encapsulation of the pop feminism the movie represents. I'm a woman, I have a vagina, never mind the trans thing. Life is hard and I have no higher aspiration than to remind you I have a vagina and a lot of the complaints I want to talk to you about. There's not even a hint of anything else Barbie might do in the real world aside from seeing a gynecologist. Dr. Barbie came out in 1973. We're here half a century later and are told nothing has changed. In a way, it's correct. Boardrooms, Congress are still overwhelmingly male. And the little female representation that does exist at the highest levels of power relies on civil rights law and women's tears. Yes, loser men have fallen behind, but this is just a reversion to nature after the artificial male world of the 1950s. And nobody really cares about loser men anyway. By acknowledging sex differences and presenting the patriarchy as permanent and practically indestructible, Barbie presents a feminism without progress or hope, a truly decadent system of thought that offers little consolation to its adherents, which is good news for anyone opposed to what the movie seeks to represent. So, if you want a preview of the discussions that are going on in the world right now um, about Barbie, that should give you an indication of how it's being weaponized as a right wing, as a right wing talking point. So that's fun. I'm sure we're going to be talking more about Barbie and the culture wars and the discussions about Oppenheimer have not been nearly as prescient, although one person became the Twitter main character for a hot minute because she said, how can we have a movie about a bomb used against the Japanese and no Japanese people appear on screen? Because there were no Japanese people who helped build the bomb. They were the victims of it. Easy enough. End of. Moving on. Um, there was another one I saw um, where it was complained about the, uh, the straight the straight white male brooding and sadness and emotion and how that was somehow bad or wrong or something like that, which I thought was an odd take. But um, it, I find it interesting that the right is choosing to attack Barbie and not Oppenheimer. Um, but I think that has to do with cultural impact because Barbie made three times as much money. So there you go. So I'm so sorry for the technical issues tonight, guys. I'm going to work on that for next week. Um, I appreciate you, and thanks for watching, and I will see you next week on the Cameron Joel News Hour. Uh, don't forget to catch me online um, at Cameron Cowan on Twitter, or should I say X, and, uh, and all your other favorite social media platforms. So we'll talk soon now. Bye-bye.
that's all for this episode of the Cameron Journal Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Visit us online at CameronJournal.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I love to talk to my followers and listeners, so please feel free to uh, get us on social media at Cameron Carolyn on Twitter. And we'll see you next time on the Cameron Journal Podcast. <laughs>